PGI is part of Promise Christian University, the uh, Providence, uh, Promise Governance Institute, to reach out to leaders of every walk of life, every background, every profession, uh, and bring the, uh, the gospel uh, with clarity and with the direction of the Holy Spirit to answer the concerns of the day and, uh, and, and the hour. We want to be a ministry that's on time. We want to be a ministry that's very sensitive to the needs of our world today, not just our nation, but the nations of the world, and that God would give us his message. Our, the message would not come from a human being. The message would come from a human being that's been inspired by the Holy Spirit. How many will say amen to that? And that's what we need. And so if a word comes out like that, I believe it could have a profound effect on, on an entire nation or nations. So we thank the Lord. And this is metanoia, a time of change, a change of thinking, change of perspective on the things. And uh, we're thankful that the Lord has directed us today. My topic is metanoia, the fog of war. Lessons learned from history. Because if we're in a fog, we can't see the direction that we're supposed to be going in. We can be going off a cliff and not know it because of the fog that's uh, in, in, around surrounding us. So we need clarity today. We need a refocusing of our vision as a nation, as a people, and as the body of Christ within the nations. It's wonderful. Someone was mentioning the growth of problems that I like to say. We now have workers in 21 countries around the world. And I believe that deserves a God bless you here today after 20 years. Praise the Lord. I give God all the glory for that today. All right, we're metanoia, the fog of war, lessons learned from history. Now, some of these people that we're going to talk about, Adele and I have actually met in life. Some have passed on, leaders of uh, different situations in their life. But we've had the privilege of meeting many of these folks that we're going to talk about today and even interviewing them on our television program. So... During the time of fog, uh, during times of, of the fog of war and the uncertainty, men and women of God put their trust and faith in Him and experienced the metanoia moments in history. We're going to, we're going to elude on uh, some of that here today. There are many definitions of the word fog. Basically, it means confusion characterized uh, by a lack of clarity. Today, our society seems to be living in an ongoing fog. We're living and driving in dense fog, even with the fog lights. It is difficult to see the path ahead. It's more difficult to determine where you are because of fog. There is a sense of being lost. People do not want to follow godly leadership that are tempted by pride, greed, fame, and fortune. They want to leave the safety of God's protection to go their own way, and ultimately they end up confused and corrupt. When we are facing calamity on every side, we as a nation need to remember our history and legacy. And whose side are we on? We must be on God's side. How many would say amen to that? Amen. In history now, Israel and Syria were at war with each other. But who was on God's side? Because the Syrian army had been uh, defeated on every side, the king felt there was a spy in the camp, and he believed it was Elijah the prophet. Now, the Syrians plot to capture Elijah. Now, the king of Syria was making war against Israel, and he consulted with his servants, saying, In such and such a place shall be my camp. But the man of God sent word to the king of Israel, saying, Be careful that you do not pass this place because the, they are coming down there. And the king of Israel sent scouts to the place about which the man of God had told him. So he warned him so that he was on guard there more than once or twice. Now the heart of the king of Syria was enraged on this matter. And he called his servants and said to them, Will you tell me which one of us is for the king of Israel? And I love the answer here that he gives. One of the servants said, <laughs> uh, well, uh, No, my lord, but the king, but the, no, my lord, the king, but Elijah the prophet, who is in Israel, is telling the king of Israel the words that you speak in your bedroom. Amen. So we know here today there's a direction from the Lord. So he said, Go and see where he is, that I may send men and take him. And it was told him, saying, Behold, he's in Dothan. So he sent horses and a substantial army there. 
And they came by night and surrounded the city. Now when the attendants of the man of God had risen early and gone out, behold, an army with horses and chariots was, was encircling the city. And his servant said to him, This is hopeless, my master. What shall we do? And he said, Do not be afraid, for those that are with us are greater than those that be with them. How many of you say amen to that today? Amen. Elijah prayed and said, Lord, please open his eyes so that he may see. And the Lord opened the servant's eyes, and he saw a multitude of mountains full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elijah. Now, I saw a painting one time of this scenario where the, uh, where the, 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 the Syrian army was surrounding uh, Dothan. And, but what they didn't see was that behind the Syrian army was the army of God standing behind them <laughs> with a greater force and greater power. And that's who, that's who, that, that is who is uh, helping us today in our lives. Metanoia moments is when God allows mankind to see his glory and power. This was a metanoia moment when heaven came down to earth and the man could see what God sees. Metanoia, a moment in history, the Battle of Pusan. Now this person I'm going to talk about, General Pak Sinyap, was the chief of staff of the South Korean army. And Adele and I had the opportunity of seeing him just before he passed away at age 99. And he was a born-again Christian. At age 99, he was still going three days a week to his office at the military uh, library and military school there in, in Seoul. And he had a, a colonel, full colonel was his personal aide. Uh, but this man is, at 99 was just a sharp and a historian uh, along the way. So we really enjoyed him and, and talking with him. This is his story. Metanoia moment history, Battle of Pusan. Without provocation, Korea, the Korean War broke out on June 25, 1950. And, uh, Korea was a nation struggling to survive after Japanese occupation at the end of World War II. The nation which was left with devastation and poverty. A nation that was vulnerable to foreign attack and invasion. But God had prepared his people. In 1907, this is an interesting connection between Pak Sun Yup, the Army Chief of Staff of the South Korean forces during the Korean War, and the revival that took place in the nation in 1907. There's an absolute connection. We didn't realize until just recently. It, uh, God had prepared his people in 1907 to so the great revival that took place in the city of Pyongyang. In, encouraged by missionaries, inspired by the Azusa Street Revival, many thousands were won through the Lord, and one of the families whose lives was totally changed because of this revival was the Pak Sun Yup family. I didn't know that. There's a connection how God, already knowing the future and knowing what this young man would do, and General Pak told Adele and I that all of his life he wanted to be a soldier. That was his whole ambition and aim in life. And, and he became not only a soldier, he became one of the greatest soldiers in the history of the Republic of South Korea. Uh, Pak Sun Yup always wanted to be a soldier. Uh, he actually was trained by the Japanese uh, in their academy in Manchuria. At the end of World War II, he returned to Poyang and started working as an assistant, a leader of the Korean independence movement against the Empire of Japan. In December 1945, he, had, he fled south due to the rising communist presence of the North. He enlisted in the constabulary as predecessor to the ROK Army as or the famous 1st Division. And we met some of them when our trips to uh, South Korea in the past, we met some of the people of the ROK Army. Just great, great fighters, very brave men. When the Korean War broke out, uh, uh, he was already a colonel in command of the 1st Division and given a task to hold the line in Seoul. However, after Seoul of, uh, fell, after the fall of Seoul, and due to the overwhelming offensive by the North Korean armored units, he was uh, forced into a fighting withdrawal. This is significant due to the fact that the 1st Division withdrew while maintaining order of battle while fighting and delaying action. This led General Pak being promoted to Brigadier General on July 25th, 1950. Pak then pulled back to, uh, to the Nandong River along the Pusan perimeter, 
the last ditch defense of the Allied forces on the southern tip. And he told us this story personally what happened that when they were the North Koreans were coming at them with tanks, and we had no tanks, all we had was a rifle unit, just an infantry unit. But we stood our ground. And I said, What'd you do then, General? He said, I prayed. I called on the Lord. And the miracle happened, we'll see. Korea here is commanded by the, the, the first division, which was responsible for holding a 55 mile front in the northern boundary of the Pusan perimeter. We had minimal weapons to fight and no tanks. Our army fought valiantly, and the people fled to safe areas in the uh, south near Pusan. As a colonel, General Pak led his troops with courage, fighting many battles. He was promoted to Brigadier General and was in charge of the defending this perimeter of the Pusan perimeter and the first division of the ROK Army. There was no there was no march for no match for, for the North Koreans, and on June 27, 1950. It was not until August that the troops and supplies began to arrive in Korea. Now, remember, they were outmanned, outgunned, and they're running low on, on ammunition at the, arm, at the armory there. I forget which city. General Black, Pack relates that at the time they were defending this perimeter, with ammunition and supplies low, they fought hard to, to defend their country. Many soldiers on both sides lost their lives. He himself came down with malaria. It was truly a scary time, he told us. With a massive enemy approaching to drive the remaining RKO army into the sea, General Pack began to pray. <laughs> his, uh, his, uh, his family became Christians as a result of the great revival of Pan Young in 1907. He prayed for divine intervention. He told me, I got out of my sick bed suffering from malaria and went to lead the troops because this would be our last stand. If we couldn't hold them off, we would be pushed to the sea. I called for every able-bodied man, enlisted or not, to pick up a weapon and hold that line no matter what. Then he told his one of his officers, if you should see me turn my back and start to run, I want you to shoot me. Now he recounted that to me. That's what he said. And it was amazing what happened next at that point. You have to remember that not only did he enlist the, the army there for that last stand, but they also had, uh, at that time, farmers that brought their pitchforks and stood there ready to go with the toe-to-toe uh, -to -toe with the enemy. With that, he put on his gear and headed to the front. Here's the miracle of divine intervention. When the KKP or the Korean army tanks were approaching, suddenly, out of nowhere, the sky was filled with U.S. bombers, and they bombed the, they bombed the, the, the enemy, uh, this entire uh, perimeter, destroying tanks and soldiers. This was a miracle moment in the midst of an unthinkable disaster when the fog of war was so thick that no hope existed. The general called upon the Lord and went out to face an insurmountable enemy. Then God answered prayer, and his nation was saved in one single day. How many know God can do that in one day? And he said, we just stood there. We, we, we thought, this is it. We're going to stand with the last man. That's how determined they were. And we're not going to surrender. We're not going to stop. Even for the tanks coming, we're going to still stand. And right in front of them came the U.S. Air Force and bombed the tanks right in front of them and caused the enemy to become frightened, and they ran back. He said, we just stood there and watched it happen. Suddenly, many battles in the Bible, doesn't it? How God intervened, intervenes and, and moves in such a marvelous way. So, right, so we know here that leaders have to see things that others don't. Mm. Their vision must transcend the fog of the now. Biblical leaders live with the conviction that a supernatural God exists. They believe God guides through prayer. Another great example is General George Patton in order uh, that the chaplains pray, who gave an order that the chaplains would pray for good weather. Now we have to understand the scenario. The war was coming to a close, 1944. The, the United States, had, uh, the other Allied troops that entered through France, through Normandy, the invasion of Normandy, worked their way in, approaching the, the border of Germany. And uh, they, so they had the tanks, General Patton's third army was approaching. Now General Patton, but, uh, General Patton also was a Christian, and he was the one that ordered the chaplain to pray for fair weather. Can you imagine that? He said, and he said, I cannot do anything 
with even with our army, it was, we can't see where we're going with this with this terrible rain and storm. It had been raining for days and days and days. We can't move. We're stuck in the place here. But if it clears up, we can enter into Germany for the first time. So he ordered the chaplain to write a prayer. So, so this is another great example. On October 22nd, 1944, Patton met with his commander, General Omar Bradley, and Bradley's chief of staff to discuss plans for taking the French city of Metz and then pushing east to the Saar River Valley a, a, in the center of Germany armament industry. Bradley, believing that the strong push might well end the war, argued for a simultaneous attack by all the Allied armies in Europe. Patton pointed out that there was not enough ammunition, food, or gasoline to support all the armies. There was enough supplies, however, for one army, Patton's third army, to attack 24 hours after getting the signal. After, vi after vigorous debate, Bradley conceded, Patton was told that the attack could take place at any time November 5th, and that aerial bombardment would be available before hand. The Allies were really fighting three enemies, Patton told Bradley, the Germans, time, and weather. The weather was the most serious threat, isn't that interesting? The third army sick rate equal the battle uh, casualty rate, but Patton could not control the weather, which offered affected weapons, aircraft, and movements of the troops. When Patton completed all preparations for battle, he turned to the Bible and entrusted everything, including the weather, to God. Imagine that. And this diary entry was on uh, in November 7, 1944. It read, two years ago, today, we were in the Augusta approaching Africa. It was blowing hard, then about 1,600 had stopped. It is now 0230, the rain, raining hard, I hope, it stops too. Uh, no, uh, nothing more I can do to prepare for the attack except to read the Bible and to pray. Now that's the commander for you, leading the troops. On November 7, 1942, there was a storm, but it stopped. The, the, the SAR campaign was launched on November 8, 1944. After one month's fighting, Patton's Third Army liberated 873 towns, 1,600 square miles. The attack was set for December 19, the invasion of Germany. The early December 1944, at 11 o'clock in the morning, on December 8, Patton telephoned the head chaplain, Monsignor James O'Neill. This is General Patton. Do you have any good prayers for weather? <laughs> we must do something about those rains if we're going to win the war. General Patton was head of the Third Army there in Europe recognized that it had to be God's intervention. A year after this publication of The War As I Knew It, Monsignor O'Neill wrote in his memoir, The War As I Saw. He told Patton over the telephone that he would research the topic and report back to him within an hour. After hanging up, O'Neill looked out at the immoderate rains that had plagued the Third Army operation for the past three months. As he searched through the prayer books, O'Neill could find no formal prayers pertaining to weather, so he composed an original prayer, which he typed on a three by five card. <laughs> and this is, this is the prayer. Almighty God, and most merciful Father, we humbly beseech thee of thy great goodness to, uh, to restrain these immoderate rains which have, uh, have, to, have to contend with. Grant us fair weather for battle. Graciously hearken to us as soldiers, as we call upon thee, that, uh, that uh, armed with thy power. And may uh, we advance from victory to victory and crush the opposition and wickedness of our enemies to establish justice among men and nations. Now that was the prayer that Chaplain O'Neill presented to General Patton. That prayer was sent to the entire Third Army. Thousands of men received that prayer. Uh, the, if the general would sign the card, he, he added personal touch, and I'm sure the men would like, so uh, said Chaplain. So Patton sat down at his desk and signed a card and returned it to O'Neill. The general continued, Chaplain, sit down for a moment. I want to talk to you about the business of prayer. Now, this is General Patton. Patton rubbed his face in his hands. He sat silently for a moment, then rose up and walked to the high window of the office where he stood with his back to O'Neill, watching the falling rain. O'Neill recalled later, 
As usual, he was dressed stunningly as a six foot two powerfully built physique mode, a forgettable silhouette against the great window. To General Patton, I saw there was the th uh, army commander to whom the welfare of men under him was a matter of personal responsibility. Now he was a general that actually led the troops. He went out to the battle. He didn't stay back and he went out to the battle. Even uh, the heart of the combat would take time to draw new direct methods, prevent trench feet, all that. He tried to take care of the men. I'm going to paraphrase now. Chaplain, how much praying is being done in the Third Army? Well, he said there wasn't too much being done. I'm afraid to admit it, General, there's not a whole lot going on. Patton left the window, sat at his desk and leaned back and said, uh, uh, playing with a pencil, he began to speak, Chaplain, I'm a strong believer in prayer. There are three ways that men get what they want, planning, working, and by praying. Any great military operation takes careful planning and thinking. Then you must have well-trained troops to carry it out. That's working. But between the plan and the operation, there's always the unknown. That unknown spells defeat or victory, success or failure. It is the reaction of the actors to the ordeal when it actually comes. Some people call that getting breaks. I call it God. Imagine General Patton saying that. I call it God. God has his part or margin in everything where prayer comes in. I want to shorten this up. It's a little lengthy today. Now, uh, up to now, the Third Army, God had been very good to us. His General Patton's words. We have never retreated. We have suffered no defeats, no famine or epidemic. This is because of a lot of people back home praying for us. Imagine that. We were, we were lucky simply because people prayed, but we have to pray ourselves too. A good soldier is not made merely by making him think and work. There is something in every soldier that goes deeper than thinking or working. It's guts. It's something that he has built in there. It is the world of truth, of power, that is uh, higher than himself. Uh, grant living is not all output, but work. A man has to uh, have intake as well. I don't know what you call it, but I call it prayer. I call it faith in God. Amen. So, so to, to paraphrase, what he did was he sent, he wrote that prayer out, sent it to all the people, and gave an order for all the entire Third Army to start praying for against that weather. And I understand, according to my statistics here, I'm going to shorten this up, it's quite late, there's a lot of material here. But I believe there were over 300 chaplains of every background, every religion, just in the Third Army itself. Can you imagine how that was? And, uh, and so they, uh, they did write the prayer. They were, they were able to, uh, the, per the rain stopped the next day. And they rolled right across and went into Germany for the first time. And that was the end of Hitler and the German army. They were in retreat by that time. Again, metanoia, out of the fog, given clarity, sight. As soon as the weather would change, they would be able to go and defeat the enemy. It was, it, it was something that was a must. It had to be done. So I'm thankful here today that we have a history in our nation of, of men and women of faith and prayer, some of the highest levels. As uh, General Pack told me, it was through prayer that he that he won so many of the great battles. He later became chief of staff of the army. And uh, when we were in uh, Korea the last time, we were at the at the War College in the museum where he had his office. When we walked in the door, he had a mural on the walls, a huge painting, a huge mural of he and General MacArthur shaking hands, and MacArthur uh, came to Busan, and, and he welcomed General MacArthur. They were great, they became great friends, so he was very proud of that. Uh, and I have a book that he signed for me of his, of the life of General Pack. He was still being honored by the United States Army, even the last time we saw him, still receiving awards for the things that he did. And it's kind of funny, he's very humorous. I said, General Pack, I said, I'd like to ask you something, sir. I said, what did you do after you got out of the Army? My gosh, you were in the Army your whole life. You became Chief of Staff of the Army, four-star general. What did you do after that? Oh, he said, Pastor Mike, I didn't do very much. He said, they made me ambassador of France and Belgium. I said, oh, that's okay. So anyway, 
Thank God bless you. Thank you very much.